Hey guys, David here from Pro Prep Coaching, bringing you this week's video content, which is dealing with hunger when on prep. Now, this doesn't just apply to people who are preparing for a bodybuilding show or a sporting event. It's prep for anything. So it could be getting ready for a holiday, prepping a body transformation. It could be working on recomposition. It's relevant for everybody. So we're going to run through, we're going to discuss. This was something we did live in our community call. So there will be some elements where I will pause for you to kind of have a think about things, but we've got all the answers that we came up with as a group and that we as coaches kind of like recommend as well and collected all that information. So let's get started. Okay. Learning outcomes, basically what we're going to go through today. In today's session, we'll be taking a short look at what hunger is and how it manifests in the body, discussing hunger and the challenges it can present to you during diets, and breaking down and discussing different strategies for tackling that hunger, how you can stop yourself from giving in to temptation, strategies for success, and then identifying and understanding the three main areas in which we can influence hunger and make sure we adhere to diet, especially during a bodybuilding prep or a, some sort of prep for an event. Okay, what is hunger? We're only going to touch on this briefly because this isn't uh, a lecture, but it's important to know why these things happen. So basically, hunger is your brain telling your body that your stomach is empty. And that's caused by uh, something called ghrelin. Ghrelin is released from the stomach. It's a hormone. And basically, it travels up and it tells the brain in the hypothalamus, a small part of your brain that handles uh, hunger and fullness, and it says, you need to eat. It says, we're hungry, you need to eat. So when that signal is released, you kind of get that growling sensation in your stomach, you feel hungry, and you start craving food. And basically, its counterpart is leptin. When you're feeling full, uh, your body will release leptin, which tells you tells your brain, you can stop eating now, we're all good. Now, an interesting aspect of leptin, just as an aside for a moment, that is challenging at the end of a prep. Leptin is stored and secreted by fat cells, as written here. So if you think about the condition your body's going to be in post bodybuilding show, post Ironman event, something like that, you're going to have very low body fat. So you're going to have less leptin because you've got less fat cells. So what that can mean is, and I'm sure we, some of us who competed before have experienced this, after after you've finished your season and you're super lean, it can be really hard to not just go nuts with food. And that's not just a willpower thing. That's actually a chemical messenger thing because you've got less leptin, which means your body is less likely to know properly when you're full until you've built up some body fat reserves again. And again, with ghrelin, uh, a lot of things influence it as well. It's not just how full and how empty your stomach is, but things like your age, your gender, your blood glucose levels, so the, the kind of like sh gl glucose and insulin level in your blood, and the leptin levels themselves can all affect ghrelin. So you've got these kind of chemical messengers that are in balance, but there's lots of aspects that cause them to be in balance or out of balance. So it's definitely something that if you're interested in, to do some extra reading on, because it's very, very interesting. Okay, the challenges that hunger presents. This was when we kind of went around the group and we discussed the different challenges that hunger presents for people. And that could have been things like uh, it makes them tired. It makes them lose their mental acuity. It, mean, it makes them uh, not perform as well in the gym. It makes them unable to get to sleep at night. You know, all these sorts of things came up and more. I find for sure concentration and focus is an issue when I'm hungry. And uh, yeah, it's about figuring out mental, physical, and nutritional strategies that are going to help you combat that moving forwards. So we did basically, it was just a discussion point here to see where people were at and to kind of build some uh, bonds between people because a lot of people are in the same boat at the moment prepping for their shows. So strategies for success. So to simplify the brainstorming, because there are so many things you can do, we broke it down into three different groupings. Nutritional strategies, things relating to food and eating and timings of food and all that kind of stuff. Physical strategies relating to activity and action. And then psychological strategies relating to willpower, mindset, and kind of like the head game of it all. So starting with nutritional strategies. So what I would like you to do is pause the video for a minute and write down 
five, or try to get five, nutritional strategies that you would normally employ, or you would think would be good to employ, to help you battle hunger when you're obviously in a deficit. Because basically being in prep is basically cutting get it to get ready for the show. We're talking about the cutting phase here. So strategies you would use while in a deficit to stop yourself from blowing it and eating off, off plan on the diet. So pause the video here, and then when you've got five, press play and we'll move on. Okay, so hopefully you managed to get five. I've collected a small group here based on things we discussed and obviously on the knowledge that we all have as well. So with nutritional strategies, first things first, you don't just eat protein while you're in a deficit because it's a muscle sparing nutrient. By muscle sparing, I mean it prevents you from losing muscle while you're in a deficit. So having enough protein is very important. But protein is also a very satiating nutrient. It keeps you feeling full for longer. So if you think about if you eat 150 calories worth of chicken breast, it's going to keep you feeling full for longer than 150 calories of, let's say, Skittles or M&Ms or even, you know, potato is good, but even like potatoes. So protein is a very satiating nutrient, so it's important to have lots of protein. And as well as that, fiber-rich foods as well. This is talking about the, com the comparison between white bread and wholemeal bread, brown pasta and white pasta, you know, kind of like making sure you get lots of uh, vegetables because fibrous foods take longer for your body to digest and they're harder for your body to break down and it means they're in your system for longer so again they give you that sense of fullness and as well as that they're good for assisting with the digestive process as well. Fiber's great. This taps into the third one which is prioritizing complex carbohydrates over simple carbohydrates. So for example if you've got 500 calories worth of potato, 500 calories worth of Haribo. Which one do you think is going to keep you feeling full for longer? Which one do you think is going to give you more satisfaction? For sure, the potatoes. Short-term gratification with Haribo might be great. I don't know what your tastes are for these things, but the body will break it down really quickly because it's a simpler carbohydrate, meaning it's shorter chain sugars. So it's much easier for your body to break down the bonds and it's very quickly absorbed. So you'll be feeling hungry again before you know it. And so, again, and that leads back into the brown pasta, white pasta, brown bread, white bread, all those kind of things. Complex carbs, for sure. Drinking plenty of water is very good as well. The stomach fullness is what triggers the, is what, is what uh, triggers the fullness, what triggers that leptin signal to your brain. And so if it's full of water, you can actually trick your stomach into sending that message up to your brain. It won't last for long because you'll drain that fluid out pretty quick, but at the same time, it can be quite useful. And research has found that drinking a pint of water before you eat your meal makes you much less likely to overeat while you're eating so because you'll feel full sooner. So especially if you've got a smaller meal, having plenty of water and plenty of fluids as well, herbal teas, hot drinks, things like that can be very good for promoting that sense of fullness because it, your stomach's full of something. You know what I mean? Now, solid foods over liquid foods. Now, soup is one of the exceptions because soup does promote a good sense of fullness. But generally speaking, if you eat, for example, if you're going to have a smoothie, for example, which would be your protein powder, some yogurt, some fruit, and then maybe some milk, and you blend it all up and you drink it, that breaks it down and it breaks some of those bonds down that your body's going to spend time, as we talk about with the complex carbs, and it'll make it much more quickly absorbed into the body. And it also condenses the size of what you're having. Because if you imagine, okay, I could be having a banana, 100 grams of skia, 100 grams of raspberries, a protein shake, and some milk. That's a lot of food. And that would keep you full for, for hours, but the smoothie will keep you feeling full for an hour tops. So solid foods over liquid foods is always more important. And also don't drink your calories away. Alcohol, sugary drinks... All these things, quick absorbed, they don't give you that sense of fullness that real food does. Next, and we'll look at this in more detail in a moment, high volume over high calorie foods. So, for example, uh, sauces. If you've got sauces, like for example, if you think about, uh, a great example is, I don't know if any of you guys like Wagamama's. Wagamama do a chicken katsu curry. I love it. It's a thousand calories a bowl. And the reason for that is the katsu sauce has so many calories in it because it's got butter, it's got spices, it's got cream, it's got tomato. It's got lots of things condensed into that sauce that's then reduced. So it's really quite potent in calorific content for such a small 
piece of food. So we want to look for high volume foods rather than high calorie foods. And this will mean for, for periods of time, reducing the amount of sources you have. And if so, going for low sugar, more simple versions. For example, I'm sure most of you on your plan have some version of a penny pasta. And instead of it being a Lloyd Grossman's pot of sauce, it'll be a tin of chopped tomatoes with some added spices because you can halve your calories for a sauce just by going for something that's higher volume and less calories. And again, it goes back to that potato uh, Haribo argument. You want things that are going to fill your stomach up and lots of leafy green vegetables. If you think you can get 100 grams of Brussels sprouts, 100 grams of broccoli, and that's like 45 calories each, that's 200 grams of food in your stomach for 90 calories. And that will give you that fullness. It's got lots of fiber. It breaks down. So you can see they're all linked, all linked. Eating regularly as well is a good nutritional strategy. Don't have massive gaps between your meals every two to three hours, especially as you get into the later stages of your prep. You're going to want to feed your body every two to three hours, especially with some protein, because again, that muscle sparing and just to give you enough energy to function. But having a good strategy and regular timings make it easier for you to sustain your your momentum and you know prevent going off plan and one from one of the coaches was chewing gum obviously we're looking for sugar-free calorie-free gum here uh but again it can give you that sense of satiation and it makes your mouth busy so it makes you less likely to be thinking about eating food if you're eating gum this split the split the crowd when we discussed it some people said it made them much more likely to eat but some people myself included find it quite useful for preventing eating as well one other thing, and this again, this split the trainers, and it's relevant for different things, was what time you eat your first meal. So you basically have uh, what's called your, like your, your window where you eat through the day, okay? So like your anabolic window. So from when you have breakfast to when you have your last snack of the day before going to bed. Now, generally speaking, if you say, okay, breakfast is at 7 in the morning, and then you have your last snack at 7 p.m. you've got a 12 hour window where you're eating uh, and then you've got a 12 hour window where you're not so the most important thing first of all is that you don't have a really long window beyond 12 hours where you're not eating because your body will be in a catabolic state for too long and you'll start getting atrophy of muscles and stuff like that important not to do that but what some people do as a strategy and this is something I've employed in the past is I push my breakfast later so let's say, for example, rather than having breakfast at 7, I have it at 10. And then I can have my last snack of the day at 10 p.m., which means I've still got the 12 hours, but the time of day when I'm most likely to snack has been kind of like nullified because I've been able to have a snack there. And if you don't eat when you first get up, it does have a bit of a suppressing effect on appetite until you eat that first meal. Until you stoke the fire, you don't get that hunger. But as Andy and Steph rightly pointed out when we discussed this, you don't want to get up in the morning and not eat, especially if you're exercising in the morning and especially if you're in the final stages of getting ready for a show. So it's relative to the circumstances you're in. So if it's just a case of I'm trying to lose weight, I want to do a body transformation, or maybe I'm in the mid stages of a prep, yeah, push breakfast later, eat your last snack later. But if you're in those final 12 to 14 weeks pre-show, have your breakfast as soon as you get up or after your after your fasted cardio, whatever you've got on your plan. That's very important too. So it's relevant to different situations, but I'd say ask your coach on that one and see what they say. Now, moving on to talk about the food volume example. This is photos of foods I've eaten, well, excluding this, over the past couple of weeks. And I actually chose this to eat, which is like an M&S beef and Chianti, like wine gravy with rosemary potatoes and cherry tomatoes. I got that specifically for this task. It's not something I would normally pick. I tried to make the sizes as relevant as possible on the, but on the plates here. But you got to go with the weight. So your regular Big Mac meal, first of all, we're talking about food volume over food calories. 1,100 calories for a Big Mac, chips, and your Coke. That's a hell of a lot of calories. And if you weighed that on a scale, what you were actually getting in food-wise, it wouldn't be that heavy, so you wouldn't fill your stomach up that much. It's just because the fat content is very high, and obviously the oils and all that kind of stuff, and the cheese. So you're going to be getting quite a lot of calories, quite a lot of bang for your buck calorie-wise. And similar with this one. This looks bigger on the plate than it really is, but it's the tub that's big. All in, the weight of this thing was only 400 grams. 
and it's 480 calories. And you can see there's only a few bits of beef in there, some rosemary potatoes. It's really not that filling. And then you compare that to four meals that I've prepared for myself over the past couple of weeks. You've got rice there, and that's 100 grams dry weight of rice that I've cooked up with some calorie-free sauce on it, 200 grams of mixed vegetables, Brussels, broccoli, cauliflower, and then a chicken breast that weighed 150 grams. So that's quite a lot of food for 450 calories. I've maximized my intake amount by being careful. So there's no calorific ketchup, there's nothing, no cheese, nothing like that on chicken. I've got a chickpea curry here which again has been made with light coconut milk, chopped tomatoes, chickpeas very healthy, high fiber. So even if it's not as big, I mean that weighs over half a kg. It's like something like 600 grams it weighed in at. It's still going to keep you filling full for longer because the chickpeas and all the other elements in there, high in fiber, it's going to take time for your body to break it down. And again with this one, hard to believe with 500 grams of white potato there done in the air fryer, just a few sprays of one cow spray, so it's really not like chips at all. I'm able to get 500 grams of potatoes, raw weight, 100 grams of mixed veg, frozen veg. It could have been even bigger if I'd done it with real veg. And then a chicken breast that weighed about 160 calories, all with some, uh, what's it called? Like sweet chili, skinny sauce across it, and some salt, 465 calories. So I could have this meal twice for one McDonald's meal. And then again, I've got a butternut squash and chicken curry here. Only 420 calories, even though I've got a little flatbread. So instead of going with a naan, I found some Greek flatbreads in Sainsbury's, about half the size, much less calorific, 420 all in. These are foods that are going to fill my stomach. That isn't going to fill my stomach, but it's not too bad calorie-wise, even if it's higher than all four of them. But this one really is. So it gives you the idea that like, you need to be strategic and tactical with your choices of food so that you can obviously be successful with not breaking your diet. Now, moving on. Physical strategies, things you can do by like activities, movement, habits that will affect success with diet when on prep. We're going to again pause your video here, think of five, and then press play. Okay, some simple strategies here. And this was a collation of what everybody put together. So first of all, this is from Coach Rob. Brushing your teeth after dinner. If you brush your teeth after the last meal of the day, you are just less likely to eat again because then you'd have to brush your teeth again. And it always seems wrong to, to eat after you brush your teeth. It's one of those fun little things you can do physically to help stop you eating. It might not work, but even if it gives you a 10% greater chance of not going off plan, very, very useful. Finding ways to distract yourself when you feel the hunger pangs. Books, TV, games, etc. Things like that. Simple, I'm feeling hungry, so I'm going to sit and read my book. I'm feeling hungry, I'm going to go for a walk. Because exercising can help suppress your appetite as well. So if you go for a walk when you're feeling hungry, or if you go to the gym, if you've got that kind of timing there, it will help suppress your hunger as well. From there, you've got more kind of simple things, removing temptation from the house. When I'm on a prep, I can't really have temptation around. Not because I'm going to break, but because it kind of tortures you, seeing all the things you could have there and you're not having them. So just remove as much temptation as possible. And for example, if there are things that your partner likes that you don't, that are a treat, make sure they get them because you're much less likely to go for something that's not your favorite and they're still able to then have something there that they like too. So these things work. Being as organized as possible as well. We touched on this before with the nutritional strategy, the timing of your meals. But if you've got the right stuff in the cupboards, the right stuff in the fridge, and you're not left going, what am I going to make for dinner? And then having to go to the supermarket when you're hungry, that's a terrible one to go to the supermarket when you're hungry because you're always tempted by lots of things. As organized as possible, less likely to binge as well. Going to bed early. This is something that will come into play in the later stages of your prep. First of all, because you're going to be tired. And secondly, because when you're sleeping, you're not feeling hungry. And so it's a great way of, uh, especially in the evening if you're feeling snacky, get your head on the pillow, get to sleep, and you'll find it'll be breakfast time ready to eat again before you know it. So that's pretty useful too. Now, moving on to psychological strategies. Same deal as before, pause the video, think of five, and then we'll move on. Or try and think of five, it's a more tough one, this one. Okay, here we go. So, first of all, and this is something you'll have probably seen all the bodybuilders on Instagram talking about, and that's called embracing the suck. 
This process is going to suck. And there's no doubt about it. Being in a deficit, your body is not happy with you because your body never wants to not have enough. It always wants you to be in a surplus. It always wants you to be comfortable. So it's going to punish you by giving you lower blood pressure, lower energy levels. You're going to have hunger pangs. Ghrelin is going to be triggering your brain all the time. But you've just got to go, I'm doing this. I'm in it. Let's just do it. And try and link the feelings of hunger you get with the associated goal of weight loss, getting shredded, and try and turn it into a positive. Like if you're lying in bed at night and your stomach is rumbling, thinking, okay, good. That's going, to be, that's going to be attacking my fat stores while I'm sleeping. So you make a positive association between the two rather than it being something negative. You associate being hungry with achieving your goal, which is very, very useful. And that, again, links back into remembering why you're doing this. If you don't have a good reason to do it, whether it being a holiday, you know, becoming your best self, photo shoot, getting on stage, doing an event, if you don't have a good reason to do it, you're not going to have a good reason to not break your diet. So link it back to the goals. Link it back to the why of why you're doing it. I also find that avoiding triggers and linked events is quite important as well. For example, if when you normally go to the cinema, you have popcorn, then when you go to the cinema and you aren't having popcorn, you're going to feel like you're missing out. And you'll go, oh, I wish I had popcorn. You'll be thinking about that while you're in there. So you've either got to find a substitute... Uh, or like, again, watching TV and eating chocolate. Like, you've got to find a substitute, whether it's carrot sticks, whether it's uh, air fried butternut squash crisps, you know, things like this, like something you can snack on instead, or flip the script and make some new linked events, doing different things together to create a new normal while you're in this kind of like abnormal deficit situation. Because triggers are, are a real thing. Again, next one is accepting that you're going to have cravings, but not giving in to them. You will be hungry, and you will probably at some point slip up. And that's okay, because you can't undo all your good work in one day, but at the same time, it's about recognizing that these cravings are normal. It's not a case that you're weak because you really want to eat the whole bar of chocolate. It's a case of understanding, like, yeah, this is a normal part of the process, and you've just got to use your willpower to resist that from happening, you know? And again, reaching out to your coaches, telling them, I've blown it, I've eaten some chocolate, or I'm super hungry today, I'm really struggling, and they'll maybe give you some advice back. I had a message just this morning about that exact thing, and obviously I'm gonna send them this presentation with some personalized advice as well. You know, it's important to understand that that's normal, but it's also really important to not give in. Finally, it's about keeping stress as low as possible and your rest and sleep as high as possible. Now, this might be seen as a physical strategy as well, especially with the rest and the sleep, because you will be more fatigued because you're getting, you're putting less fuel in the car, so the tank is going to be running empty and you are going to be feeling a lot more tired all the time. So sleep and rest and recovery as well is going to be harder. So sleep and rest as high as possible. And keeping stress low, I'm sure you've all heard the phrase hangry. Now, we all get hangry and you're going to be hangry a lot. You know, so trying to keep yourself in low stress situations is important for preventing the buildup of hanger and frustration at life. An example I gave during the call was during the lockdown, I would play Call of Duty with some of my friends online. But when I got to a certain stage of my diet, I just couldn't do it anymore because I found it too annoying when I got shot. I found it too annoying when they weren't covering me. And that wasn't because of anything changing with the game dynamic. It was because I was really hungry. And when you're hungry, you get pissed off. And again, that just links right back into embracing the suck, but also tactically avoiding situations where you're going to get frustrated. Simple as that. Find something more soothing to do for a few months until you're done. Okay, summarizing what we've discussed. We now know that hunger is triggered by several factors in the body, both physical and hormonal, when we're talking about ghrelin and leptin. Being organized with your eating is very important. Having a structure to your eating plan, that's where we come in as your coaches. And it's one of those reasons why most of you probably have in the evening some sort of skier with a gel, with a hearty jelly and with some berries because the protein is slow digesting and stuff like that. And like casein protein as well before bed, slow digesting protein, muscle sparing, but also keeping you full during the night. So we help keep you organized, but you need to be prepped. You need to have all the right food in your cupboards. Keep the other foods away, all very important when you're organizing your eating. 
As we've discussed and as you've written down, there are lots of different strategies you can employ to tackle the hunger, nutritional, physical and psychological. And finally, ensuring you have a good goal-driven why for the diet. Why am I doing this? Why is it worth it, me embracing this suck? You know, why am I pushing myself to a point where my body's uncomfortable? You know, like, keep that in your mind and I think you'll find that you'll do pretty well. Anyway, this was before when we went to the question section, but if you have any questions regarding the diet side of your prep here with ProPrep, drop a message to your coaches, whether it's myself, Andy, Steph, Natalie or Rob, whoever you're working with, and they will be able to help you, guide you, and hopefully bring you to your best self and to that big success that we're all looking for. Anyway, thank you for your time. I hope this has been useful. Take care. Bye for now.